to thank you all for joining us for Lyndon Johnson, teacher, politician, president with the LBJ Presidential Library. President Lyndon B. Johnson is known for being the civil rights president, but he was so much more than that. His years as a teacher, a Texas representative, a congressman, and a president shaped his political career and reputation. His family, determination, and genuine care to make the United States a better, more equitable place is really at the heart of this complex individual. So join the LBJ Library to explore this fascinating president from his childhood through adulthood and to his decision not to run for a second term. And this program is led by Cheryl Taylor, who's a docent at the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library and Museum. So all nearly 70 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Cheryl for joining us uh, this afternoon. And Cheryl, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Well, welcome, good afternoon. Um, Robert covered it very well. Uh, Y'all wanted to know a little bit more about his biography. And so we've started with where he started and that's as a teacher. And then we go to politician and president. And when you start, you definitely have to start at the very beginning. This is a great picture. It's one of his first, he's brushing Teddy's fur. Um, and then at the next time, and he was born, we'll have a slide for that, for his birth certificate. He was born in High, Texas, in a home, uh, which is Central Texas, um, to on August 27, 1908. Um, as you read this very interesting birth certificate, his father was Sam Johnson. His mother is actually Rebecca Baines Johnson, but on the birth certificate, she's just Miss Baines, which I thought was interesting. Um, also on this, you'll see that there's a, a different kind of take on how they list about the child, but that shows the time period he was born in. He also had um, four siblings, and they were Sam Houston, this is brother, and three sisters, Rebecca, Josepha, and Lucia. He was the oldest of the four. As he's growing up, he was about third grade, and he came from a family who also was involved in politics, fought grandfather's father. And then he also started school. His mother was a teacher for a while. And as we have a picture of his report card, it's about third, fourth grade. And the interesting part about it is you come down to the word deployment and it took, I did not know what that was and come to find out that was learning how to get along with others, manners as such. And we thought it was interesting that at the, for a while he had a C and then he definitely got better as he went along. By the time he graduated high school, and he was very well liked in high school. He was actually his 11th grade uh, president. But then he came, his parents, after he got through the 11th grade, his parents pressured him into believing that he needed to go to college. And so he enrolled in Southwest Texas State Teachers College and uh, was only there for a few weeks and then decided with a friend to head to Southern California to make his way there. He worked in a one of his cousin's legal offices. And then he also did mainly a lot of part-time jobs. So he moves back to home and then does um, what the Southwest Texas State Teachers College was considered was a sub college. And what that meant was, for anyone who graduated from a high school that was not accredited, you would take your 12th grade courses at that school and then you'd be enrolled in that school, which is what Johnson did. He um, started there and then he took a break of nine months and taught at a Mexican American school about 90 miles south of San Antonio um, for nine months. And it was here that it really, he himself did not grow up wealthy, but they always were able to 
have food on the table, take care of each other. But these children he saw were not going to get those opportunities. And that stuck with him forever, for his entire life. And then he gets back to college and he graduates with a bachelor in science. Uh, while he was at college, sorry about that, he was on the debate team and he was very good at that point. A lot of people believe during this time is where he really learned to hone in on his way of persuading others and finding a common ground. And then from here, he uh, then did graduate. He got a Bachelor of Science plus his teaching certificate. Um, just to let you know, he did teach for one year in Houston at Sam Houston High School as a public speaking teacher. But then he had made good friends with the president at the college. And there was a special election with um, Richard Kleinberg. And he had appointed Johnson to be his congressional secretary. And at this time, and the paper indicates, he is now going to DC. And so he leaves for DC. And then he realizes he needs to be, he needs to get involved in politics. If he's really going to change the life of those Mexican American students, he needed to be in politics. And at this time, you could not be a bachelor and be trustworthy. So he knew he had to find the right part partner. And back in Texas, he had met a very special woman. Claudia Alta Taylor, which goes by the nickname of Lady Bird. And he invites her out to their first date where he proceeds to ask her to marry him in which she replies, uh, no, and you're crazy. But they do send love letters back and forth for several months and she does realize this is the person for her. And Johnson comes and picks her up in Austin. They go to San Antonio to get married and they spend three days in Mexico for a honeymoon and then they're bam right back into Washington DC. We'd like to show this um, because a lot of people do wonder how in five years he was able to pass over 1200 laws and a lot of it has to do with this pedigree. He started out as his congressional aide or secretary he then was elected as a Texas U.S. Congressman and then elected as a Texas U.S. Senator um, to D.C. He became a Senate Majority Whip, as you can see, a Senate Minority Leader and then a Senate Majority Leader. And then he becomes a Vice President. And we do believe that a lot of that is where he comes in to play when it comes to the campaigning and understanding how to win an election. He knows everything he needs to know about all the legislators. He goes, at the time, he thinks he's gonna run for president. He winds up not getting the nomination. It was, got, it was won by John F. Kennedy. But Kennedy knew he needed a great res, uh, vice president, someone that would help bring in Texas and the South. And he asked Johnson to join him as vice president, which Johnson then accepted. Kennedy also knew he wanted to keep his vice president involved in, the, um, in his cabinet. And so before the, they won the president and vice president, Russia had launched Sputnik. This was a very big black eye to the Americans because they thought this was, they thought of you know, the USR as a third world country and for them to outdo the US in technology and getting into space was quite, became quite urgent. And so Kennedy decided he was going to make Johnson the head of that program. And so he sends this memo and asks questions like, do we have a chance to beat the Soviet unions by putting a laboratory in space? You know, do we just go around it? Do we do, excuse me, a rocket? How much will it cost? Are we, are we, are, is, are we working 24 hours now? to get this launched? Or should we be building large boosters? All these questions. And he then at the end, he does say that uh, Jim Webb, Dr. Wisner, Secretary McManera and other responsible officials would cooperate with Johnson on getting this going as early as possible. So Johnson, who gets a one page memo, sends not one response, not two, 
not three, not four, not five, but six. And that sets up letting everyone know if he is going to do something, if he is going to be in charge of something, he is going to know it forwards and backwards. And then we come to the beginning of their campaigning for a second term. Um, they had been, they flew into Texas. They had been to San Antonio. They'd flown to Dallas. They were going down through downtown Dallas. And then I'm going to let Lady Bird in her, uh, from one of her uh, diaries, tell you exactly what happened. Friday, November 22nd. It all began so beautifully. After a drizzle in the morning, the sun came out bright and beautiful. We were going into Dallas. In the lead car, President and Mrs. Kennedy, and John and Nellie, and then a secret <laughs> service car full of men, and then our car with Lyndon and me, and Senator Yarbrough. The streets were lined with people Lots and lots of children, all smiling, placards, confetti, <coughs> people waving from windows. Suddenly, there was a sharp, loud shot. That gives you an idea of how the presidency began for LBJ and Lady Bird. A lot of people, um, he was the first president to take the oath of office uh, west of the Mississippi and the first president to take the oath of office in Air Force One. And when they went to, this would have been President Kennedy's Air Force One, and they found a book which they had thought was the Bible, and he took the oath of office on that Bible, but it was actually a Catholic missile. Um, they also, he was the first president to get the, take the oath of office from a woman judge, Sarah T. Hughes, who um, he knew well, and Kennedy had just appointed as a judge, and so she was very familiar with both Kennedy and President Johnson. Um, it was actually Mrs. Kennedy who said that they needed to go ahead. They thought initially that they would go to D.C. and have him take the oath of office, but she felt that the American people needed to know there was a sitting president right now, um, and that is why she is also there. They do get back to D.C. Um, they go back to their vice president's home, which was called the Elms, and um, he starts laying out his presidency, his great society, as he calls it. And as he is going through it, he's talking with his staff. This is what, how we're going to do this, where we're going to start. And one of them responded, you can't do you this. Can't. This, is, this is too much. This is, you'll never be able to get through all this. And his response was, well, what the hell's the presidency for? And I love this by him saying this, because to me, this shows there is no stopping him. We are moving forward and we're not going back. And so he does begin and he does his very first one is for civil rights. And I have a video for y'all to watch. No memorial oration or eulogy could more eloquently honor President Kennedy's memory than the earliest possible passage of the Civil Rights Bill for which he fought so long. When tragedy lands Lyndon Johnson in the presidency, he sets civil rights at the top of his agenda. Now, civil rights leaders at first didn't trust him. Many of them said to me, we couldn't believe that a man with a Southern accent 
would ever be really on our side. In his heart, Johnson had been on their side for years. And when he taught those Mexican-American kids in Catula, Texas, he saw the poverty in their eyes, he saw what discrimination was doing to them. Johnson's relationship to the Mexican-American community in Texas was a very personal one. And he knew how important it was to give them an opportunity. But in Congress, Johnson's voting record suggested otherwise. He had voted consistently in the past with his fellow segregations from the South until 57. No one had ever succeeded in getting a civil rights bill through the Senate. Johnson sets out to do it in 1957, and he does it. For the first time, his ambition and his compassion to help people coincide, and it becomes an unstoppable force. 1964, armed with the power of the presidency, Johnson urges a new session of Congress to make swift progress on civil rights legislation outlawing segregation in public spaces. The Southerners filibuster, paralyzing the Senate for 83 days. President Johnson declared to Richard Russell, I've got to run over you, Dick. Unlike what happened in the past, there will be no compromise. We're going to take it all. He brings the Republicans to join the Northern Democrats, breaks that filibuster, the historic Civil Rights Act ending segregation in the South is formed. Buoyed by their victory in 64, civil rights leaders began to demand legislation that would provide equal voting rights for all Americans. On March 7, 1965, we had planned to march from Selma to Montgomery to dramatize to the nation and to the world that people of color wanted to register to vote. The Selma police confront the peaceful demonstrators with tear gas and billy clubs. They call it Bloody Sunday. The White House is flooded with calls and telegrams condemning the violence and demanding the passage of new voting rights legislation. Johnson understood that there were those moments when you had to act immediately to mobilize that public sentiment and get Congress to act. It is wrong deadly wrong to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. I watched that speech for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that evening. But when Linda Johnson said, and we shall overcome, I looked at Dr. King, tears came down his face. And Dr. King said, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery. The Voting Rights Act will be passed. April, 1968, Dr. No memorial oration. Sorry about that. Um, now we have the signing of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, there's a lot of people that forget at this time period, um, the president would invite anyone who he felt helped him get a bill made into a law here in America. And one of the main things that they would give out are the pens that actually touched the piece of paper that became an American law. Johnson had 75 people that he gave pins to. So um, you can see how he had to sign his name. I don't have that photo with me, but it's a very, he had to sign his entire name, the date, put Washington, D.C. There were a lot of dots in order for 75 pins to actually touch that piece of paper. And this is where his presidency begins as far as what was going on in America at the time. At that time, uh, Americans without high school education was 54 million. That was more than 25% of our population. Americans living in poverty were at 35 million, and that was more than 20% of the population. Uh, 
And then Americans over 65 living in poverty, which a lot of people don't even think about today, is with six millions, about 33% of the senior population. Because at this point, we have no legislation for improving high schools. We have no legislation for helping war on poverty. And we have no legislation for helping the elderly be able to afford their health care. And that is all going to change. We know he began with civil rights, which he stayed with his entire five years as president. But his other one was war on poverty. After remembering those children and that Mexican-American at school in Catula, Texas, he knew that if you were going to change anyone's destiny, give them the opportunities, they all needed to, first of all, have the opportunity to have education. And they definitely needed the opportunity to live in a decent home. So he passes the Appalachian Act, which goes for, uh, through the Appalachian Range. And a lot of these people didn't even have running water didn't have electricity. And he goes and he actually meets with the people. And he was always about meeting with the actual people and getting to know them and understanding their needs. And then also health insurance. A lot of people don't realize that Medicare and Medicaid came under the Social Security Act under Johnson. And as he's giving President Truman and his wife Bess their first Medicare cards. Then education. A lot of people don't realize he passed over 66 education laws, the most of any president. And that this one was for the higher education law, which was going to education act, excuse me, that was going to help them smaller towns and other places be able to build a high school. And he chose to do this at his, he had moved his one room childhood school onto the ranch and this is one of his teachers, and he wanted to do, give this, do this in um, this, uh, this way because he was still reminiscing about teaching those Mexican-American kids. And he says, I shall never forget the faces of the boys and girls in that little Mexican school. And I rem remember even yet the plain, the pain of realizing and knowing that college was closed to practically every one of those children because they were too poor. And I think it was then that I made up my mind that this nation could never rest while the door of knowledge remained closed to any American. And he believed that the entire time. And then we have now what has happened at the end of the five years as his presidency. We not only have more people, not only are there more people attending high school, there are more people than now being able to go to college. He dropped the poverty rate from 20% to 12. It has never been done before or since. There were more African-Americans elected as officials and Hispanics went from 300 to over 1400. And as all presidents since Teddy Roosevelt has had to do is continually protect our national parks in any acreage within that. He was also very aware of the arts and due to Lady Bird's interest in the environment, the environment. When he came into office, the New York Ballet was actually getting ready to go bankrupt. And so between the arts and the environment, he created new legislation, which would help promote and keep those a part of this country. Lady Bird's environmental endeavors were highly regarded and she believed very much that we could protect the beauty of this country. One of the pieces of legislation that LBJ absolutely passed for her was the Beautification Act. And that was to help get rid of the majority of the billboards that were littering our highways. So that when you came down the highways throughout this country, you could see the beauty of where you were. And he did pass it for Lady Bird and he made sure Congress knew that this was going to pass and it was gonna be done for her. And we all love this picture because it shows the joy that he got in giving her the first pen of her new, of the act that was so dear to her. 
This is a wall we use because 1200 laws is a lot of laws to understand and know. But these are what we consider the 40 that most people do associate today and don't realize that wasn't there before President Johnson. Um, civil rights, voting rights, the fair housing, there was the aid to Appalachia, there was a teacher corps, there was guaranteed student loans, just to name a few. There was a lot about highway safety. This is, you can thank President Johnson for seatbelts. Um, there was also a lot about outer space in the space uh, war. There was also a lot about different narcotics, drug controls, uh, clean air, clean water, just to name a few, but it's, it's really interesting to read this. And someone did ask him one time what he thought was his most important piece of legislation, and he felt it was the Voting Rights Act, because that was giving everyone in this country the opportunity to have their voice heard. Now, you may wonder, how did he get all that legislation passed? Well, for those of you who know and a little bit about Johnson, have, should probably have heard about the Johnson treatment. And we have a little bit of an explanation to go on how that actually worked. Part of the LBJ treatment was physical. You knew when Lyndon started breathing in your mouth that you were finished. But much more importantly was the mental part of the treatment. We used to say people are moved by love and fear. And the trick is to put the right combination together. He would frequently take his fingers and press into your chest, or in some cases, even almost lift you up some by your uh, lapel, where I find myself in most cases saying, yes, sir, Mr. President, whatever I can do to make it happen. And that gives you just a little bit of an insight to how he was able to get so much legislation passed. But as we know, he came into office during the Cold War, number one, and number two, he came into office with the Vietnam War. There had been six presidents, it started back, uh, six presidents had been dealing with Vietnam, uh, mainly in an advisory role as we were. And then unfortunately under LBJ, it became more about putting people on the ground. Dick Russell, who was one of his mentors and dear friends, in DC has a conversation with him, as you can see in 1964, about his thoughts on the Vietnam. What do you think about this Vietnam thing? What, what I'd like to hear you talk a little bit. Uh, frankly, Mr. President, if you were to tell me that I was authorized to settle it as I saw fit, I would uh, respectfully decline to undertake it. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, damn worst mess I ever saw, and uh, I, I, I don't like to brag. I never have been right many times in my life, but I knew we were going to get in this sort of mess when we went in there, and I don't see how we were going to ever get out without fighting a major war with the Chinese and all of them down there in those uh, rice paddies and jungles. I just don't see it. It's, uh, I, I just don't know what to do. Well, that's the way I've been feeling for uh, it's, it's period, six months. Uh, our, our, our position is deteriorating, and uh, it looks like the more we try to do for them, the less they're willing to do for themselves. <clears throat> so in hearing that voice recording, I'm sure you hear from both sides, or all sides of that recording, that they were not knowing what to do and that it was a mess. Johnson then in 1966 does go to Vietnam. He wanted to see the soldiers. He visits hospitals. He visits different places. Um, he then also, a lot of people don't realize that both Linda and Lucy's husbands were serving in Vietnam. And these were not desk jobs, they were truly serving. And Linda's husband, Colonel Rob, would send him tape recordings of what he was seeing going on. And this picture to me says so much about how President Johnson was seeing it, what he knew about it, and had wasn't much he could do. And that was very difficult for him. And then comes a time when he was going to, he would qualify to run for another four-year term 
because he had only served the last year of Kennedy's term. And there had been a lot of discussion back and forth on whether he should run again or was it time to not. Um, at the time he is giving this, um, not very many people knew actually what he was going to say. And then by, as he's doing this, he does surprise many people because he decides he will not seek another term as president. A lot of people felt that it had to do with Vietnam. And also what a lot of people did not know is he did have a heart problem and his health was not doing as well. And he felt that it was not right to do that to the American people to take on a job where he was pretty sure he wasn't gonna be able to finish. And I think that takes a lot of courage. And then Lady Bird, this is a great opportunity to get to know her true relationship with Johnson, which was that was a team. This was a team that she was always there to have his back. And one of our favorite voice recordings that most people who come to the library or who visit our website like to hear is this one on her grading one of his speeches. So I'm going to let you listen now. You want to listen for about one minute to uh, yes, uh, my critique, or would you rather wait till yes, tonight? Yes, ma'am. I'm willing now. <laughs> um, I thought that you looked strong, firm, and like a reliable guy. Your looks were, were splendid. The close-ups were much better than the distance ones. Well, you can't get them to do it. Uh, well, well, I would say this. They were more close-ups than they were distance ones. Uh, during the statement, you were a little breathless. And it was too much looking down, and I think it was a little too fast. Not enough change of pace. Uh, a drop in voice at the end of sentence. Um, there was a considerable pickup in drama and interest when the questioning began. Uh, your voice was not noticeably better, and your facial expression was noticeably better. I think the outstanding things were that the close-ups were excellent. Uh, you uh, need to learn, when you're going to have a prepared text, you need to uh, 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 have the opportunity to study it a little bit more and to read it with a little more uh, conviction and interest and change of pace. Uh, well, the trouble you... is that they criticize you for taking so much time. They won't use it all for questions. And their questions don't produce any news. If you don't give them news, we catch hell. So my problem was trying to get through before 10 minutes, and I still ran 10 minutes a day. And I took a third of it for the questions. And I could have taken, if I'd have read it like I wanted to, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what to cut out. Maybe I ought to cut out Mary's heart name. But uh, I thought that every place one of those names dropped, they'd call up the fellow and ask him about it, and he'd get his name in the paper, and then publicize it good, and it helped Mm -hmm. I believe if I'd had that choice, I would have said uh, uh, use uh, 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 13 minutes or 14 uh, for the statement. Um, in general, I'd say uh, it was uh, a good B+. Plus. How do you feel about it? I thought it was much better than last week. Well, uh, I, I heard last week, see, and, and didn't see it and, and didn't hear all of it. Uh, and, and, and at any rate, I felt uh, sort of on safe ground. I mean, like you had sort of uh, gotten over a, a hump psychologically and in other ways. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear everybody else's reaction. And that we'd love to hear that because it does show the true bond that these two had. Another thing we have is um, as early as 1963, they were talking about, you know, running, how many terms, running for president. And Lady Bird writes this letter to him. My conclusion, stay in, realize it's going to be rough, but whenever we have, it's hard to read on here, have. Um, but remember we worry. But remember we worry when we have much before, uh, worry about things that we usually do not happen. Pace yourself with, um, in written, you know, I'm sorry about this, but I'm having a hard time reading it on the screen. Um, 
written for your personality. If you lose in November, it's all settled anyway. And if you win, we will have, we will go for a good three years and three to four months, and we will discuss about it then. Lord be with us and let us live that long. We will then, you will be at 59 and the, by the end, a mellow 60. And I believe the juices of life will be stilled enable you to enjoy coming home and enjoy the peace. And there may be grandchildren. And there was grandchildren. <laughs> This is his first grandson, uh, little uh, Lyndon. And they are at the ranch where truly was, where Lyndon felt exceedingly comfortable and felt like he could be himself. And at this picture, I love it because you're seeing Yuki the dog. A lot of people knew that President Johnson had beagles, but this was a stray that his daughter Lucy had actually found in uh, Johnson City that he wound up taking from her because he fell in love with this job because he said what he lacked in pedigree, he made up for in spirit. And that's how he, a lot of it, how he saw himself. And uh, Lady Bird had had a pool put in because she wanted him to get more exercise. And this picture, um, the daughters, Lucy, which does still live here in Austin and Linda, which lives in Virginia, but they do have share stories with us. And she talked about how the reason she put that in is so he'd exercise. And she would always say to him, you need to get in the pool. And he goes, I'm in the pool, but he was still working. And I just think that's really fun um, relationship between them. So he was grandpa here. Um, the, his daughters talk about, he loved howling with the dog. He thought that it was fun. Um, the daughters talk about, as we look through these slides, how when they started having their children, he became like a doting daddy. He really enjoyed having his time with his grandchildren and brought him even to a briefing. And also they would have lunch pretty much every day together. And they, the daughters tell you that they got to spend as much time with him, probably more time with him there than before he was president because they were all still in the White House because the daughters had moved there while their husbands were serving in Vietnam. And then he did attend the moon launch, uh, which was, um, in July 16th, 1969, because he worked a lot with the space program. Um, he also is the reason that Cape Canaveral was also renamed the Kennedy Center in honor of President Kennedy. And so they come back to Texas. And the reason we're here on the UT campus is because Lady Bird actually had two degrees from UT, one in history and one in journalism. And the state, the university said, if you're willing to build your library on the campus, we'll donate the land. And they also created a LBJ public affairs college. So this showing you at uh, the beginning in 1967 of them building the library. And then we come to 1971, May 22nd, where they do the dedication. And you'll see there's several dignitaries there and um, welcoming the new library into the system. And we find this great because it's a full circle. As you know, he did start out as a teacher and he wound up ending as a teacher at the public affairs school. He spoke there quite often. And we all love the fact he's also letting his hair grow out and uh, becoming a more relaxed figure and enjoying where he was. And, and this last appearance, this is his last speech he gives before he passes away um, in 19, January of 1973. Four years after leaving the White House, Johnson convened a civil rights symposium at the LBJ Library, where he made his last public address. We have proved that great progress is possible we know how much still remains to be done. Nearly two generations later, four presidents came to the LBJ Library for a civil rights summit to take stock of where we are today and to reflect upon Johnson's role in civil rights. Lyndon Johnson came along with his great uh, insight and political courage 
and literally changed my personal life and the life of everyone that lived in America. Just as Abraham Lincoln stewarded the 13th Amendment through Congress, Johnson's leadership embodies the power of the presidency to redeem the promise of America. Through these efforts, LBJ earned the highest compliment a democracy can provide. He made us one people. Because of the civil rights movement, because of the laws President Johnson signed, new doors of opportunity and education swung open for everybody. They swung open for you, and they swung open for me. And that's why I'm standing here today, because of those efforts, because of that legacy. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then, my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. Well, that concludes today's tour. Hopefully you were able to get a lot more information about LBJ from beginning to end and how he did was a teacher, an incredible politician and president. Also, I like to let people know that one of the positives that came out of COVID is the majority of the presidential libraries were able to upgrade their websites and to let you know, if you go on ours for the permanent, you can pretty much tour all the permanent collections. There are more voice, voice recordings. And um, also in the last slide that you saw, which showed the four presidents, we had a civil rights symposium as they talked about in 2014 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of signing the Civil Rights Act. And we had panels during the day for three days. We had panels during the day in four of our five presidents came. And that is all available on YouTube, I believe still, um, if you're interested in watching that. Thank you for your time today. So folks, let's give Cheryl a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and now we'll take approximately 15 minutes of questions. If anyone has any questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to address them as they come in uh, chronologically. Uh, in addition, if you have any comments, you can get those into the chat. Okay, um, okay here we are. And Cheryl, by the way, is being joined by Laura Egert. And Laura is the volunteer coordinator at uh, the LBJ Library, and she'll be fielding some questions as well. Yep. Hey, everybody. All right. <laughs> right. So Patricia says, um, Johnson knew how to work Congress to get his bills passed despite strong opposition. How do you think he would deal with the current Congress unwilling to reinforce <laughs> civil rights legislation after the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act? And uh, how would he uh, react to states limiting voting rights? Sure. Would either of you like to touch that rail? Well, I can tell you on this, I'm gonna let Laura speak also. I can tell you on the state part, he would not be happy. <laughs> I don't believe um, because he doesn't, he would not see that as giving everyone the op same opportunity. Yeah, I will, um, I agree with that. We, so being a federal building, you know, I have to be careful what I say, um, but we, I don't want to speak for LBJ because I mean, you know, he, he's not here to defend himself, but um, if you look at his daughters and what they have done mm -hmm. to carry on his legacy and the LBJ Foundation, which um, helps support the library, are they are very, very, very much involved in voting rights and ensuring voting rights continue. Lucy Johnson has done the um, Selma Bridge March almost every year. Um, she was very close to John Lewis and we continue to try to pull, you know, to work with that. I do think that of current politicians, you know, the watching the way Joe Biden was in Congress even like and would work across the aisle, like that is a good example of the type of, con of congressman I think he would be today. But I mean, who knows, right? Like we can't, we can't say what he would think though. I think he would be very much more for 
voting rights and more rights for all people. And it's very sad to see what has come with his legacy. I tell people all the time that it's hard for me because we live in the 60s every day, right? We study the 60s, we talk about the 60s every day. And then I go home and I watch the news and it's so hard to watch because of being here all the time and what we're used to seeing here, so. Well, in my perspective is, you look at the legislation he's passed and you look at today and you're just like, wow, we are still dealing with that legislation and not having it. But I agree with Laura. I think he would be, he was all about at least giving everyone the opportunity to make of what that opportunity was their choice, but to at least have it. And I think he would have been a little, I think he'd be a little disappointed that our, our legislatures don't work as much together as for us <laughs> as we uh, Claudia, Claudia says, thank you. This was very good. Patricia says, I attended a conference in Austin and had time to visit the library. Oh, it was an amazing experience, especially for someone who was a teenager during his presidency and only really knew the Vietnam connection. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge today. Uh, Sally says, this was such a wonderful presentation. I learned so much about LBJ and all his significant accomplishments, uh, plus his personal side. So thank you. Uh, Mary would like to know, was Johnson's comment, we shall overcome in uh, the speech before Congress, was that adopted by Martin Luther King? No, I think it was the other way around. I think right. that LBJ said it in a show of solidarity with the civil rights movement. And it come from the staple singers? They, yeah, they did the song, We Shall Overcome, and it just became, there was this, the song and it became the rallying cry of the civil rights movement. And so I think that LBJ continued it on to show that he was supportive. Mm -hmm. So folks, as we start to wind down, if you have any more questions or comments, now is the time. Uh, Diane asked, uh, you mentioned that LBJ had voted with the Southern segregationists until 1957. So what prompted his switch and was his prior voting record a deliberate strategy to build his relationships in Congress? Hmm. Yeah, great question. That is exactly the case. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, say, so yeah. Um, he, he was biding his time, right? He said at one point, um, you know, I, I now have the opportunity and I intend to use it, that he knew that he had to appease people to add, make the little strides they did. The Civil Rights Act of 1957, while it was a very watered down bill and didn't do a whole lot, he did support it and you know worked to get the little bit he could passed while he was waiting for the chance to do it. So as vice president, of course, he worked with Kennedy to get legislation passed. And then when he was had his own chance, by God, he intended to use it. And he absolutely did. Yeah, I believe that what the hell is the presidency for is probably the best statement of who he was. Mm -hmm. That he got the chance, he was not going to waste it. Uh, an anonymous attendee would like to know, how was LBJ's personal relationship with JFK? Oh, let me answer that one. Do you I'm going to let Lori answer <laughs> I know some. She definitely no. knows more. <laughs> With JFK, they actually had a really close relationship. Mm -hmm. um, there, I mean, there were things where, I mean, we know from, mm -hmm. you know, from time and hindsight that JFK didn't trust him completely, that he did worry that he would, you know, try to take over and do things that, um, you know, and get the credit for things. But he did know that LBJ was a good ally to have instead of an enemy. LBJ and Robert Kennedy did not get along yeah. at all. They He did keep him on as attorney general until Robert Kennedy decided to leave, but um, they had a very contentious relationship, but the Johnsons and the Kennedys were pretty close. Um, the the or Lucy Johnson tells the story of the day of the assassination and how, you know, JFK can she considered a friend like they you know since he was younger like she had kind of um you know was seemed more close to him and Jackie in age even though you know there was still quite a 
gap there, but she did consider them friends and it was horrible for anything to happen to him as they were all so close. Um, there, we have a great seven page letter that Mrs. Kennedy wrote to LBJ mm -hmm. the day of the funeral that was, you know, thanking him for his kindness and everything that he had done walking behind the casket, how uh, John would have, Jack would have appreciated that so much. And so you see that there was friendship later through the years, Mrs. Kennedy got more critical of LBJ. Um, but mm -hmm. I think it was a lot of Bobby's influence after the assassination as well. And so um, the, I mean, Ted Kennedy was close to the library, you know, did things for us through the years. So I think that the Kennedy Johnson relationship was pretty strong. Follow up question from Jack wants to know what did LBJ think when Bobby Kennedy announced his presidential candidacy? I don't I've not read anything about that. Uh, yeah, I don't know that we have anything yeah. to know what he thought about that. Um, I think that, I mean, LBJ knew other people were going to get into the race and LBJ was, you know, already planning not to run. So I think he just kind of wasn't too worried about it. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I think that he knew that he would pass along, you like, you know, that mm -hmm. Bobby Kennedy would at least go along with the he wouldn't turn back any of this legislation that LBJ had started. So I think in that case, by the time he had the chance to do things, LBJ was, you know, would have supported him, though he would have supported Humphrey more just because he's his vice president. But, you know. Yeah. So uh, Huck has a comment and a question. Uh, Huck says, I love how LBJ physically and psychologically towered over Congress, yeah, uh, you know, congressmen uh, to persuade them. Uh, and uh, Cheryl, how tall uh, was uh, LBJ? Do we happen to know that off the top of we our do. heads? Yeah, yeah, he was 6'3". Wow. And that was very tall for that time period. There was not a lot of tall people. Another sure. favorite um, phone conversation in our building and online is between him and Joe Hager of Hager Pants because they have a very in-depth conversation about how a man's pants should fit. Because you have to remember, being that tall at this time, he'd have trouble finding clothes. But that's one of the favorites also of the building. The yeah. inappropriate favorite. <laughs> Just so we all know it going is, in, if you Google it, you will find it. <laughs> but please have headphones on or no children around when you listen to it. It's not. Yeah, it, is. it is a very, very but, much talks about how his <laughs> genitalia fit into his pants. We'll put it that way. But that's who he was. Yeah. He was. Bark off, as he says, everything's off. So, you know, how can we follow that? I think we might have to end it there. It's, uh, it's almost three o'clock. Um, so folks, uh, those who are watching live, uh, look for an email for me tomorrow with the recording, with the feedback survey, and with information about some other upcoming uh, virtual presidential uh, library visits. I'll also include um, uh, Laura's email address in case folks have any uh, additional questions they want to ask one on one. Thank I want to give a big thank you to Cheryl for a wonderful job and for oh. Laura for helping out with tech and with Q&A and also uh, for Sheila for helping organize this. Um, Laura and Cheryl, do you have any last words before we wrap it up? We hope to see you here in Austin, Texas at the library. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know if you're coming. We can yeah. arrange a tour with Cheryl. <laughs> there, you there you go. All um, right. Thank you so and much. Thank, I just want to say thank you to you for doing things yeah, like this, thanks, Robert, yeah. for um, people. I think it's great. Yeah. Happy to, happy to do it. Yeah. So thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Laura. And yes, go visit Cheryl. Uh, Austin has so many great libraries, the public library, the UT library, and of course the LBJ library. So I uh, thank you all so much and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye, -bye.